the hidden violence behind this matrix, behind government. This organization only knows how to solve problems through one way, a singular way, and that's through the threat of and use of violence to solve any problems, versus through the plurality of nonviolent solutions that you and I already share. So what are your thoughts on that? It generally makes sense. I suppose, what would you then recommend that we do in response to uh, what you claim as an unfair treatment, an unfair treatment or an unfair use of power? Um, well, I guess I wouldn't say so much as unfair. It is, uh, it is violence. It's, it, it's a contradiction from that way, which we don't use in our lives to solve problems. Right? We don't use violence to solve problems, but the political process tricks us to become participants in that, um, in that, in that hunger game, in that voting game, in that, uh, that game where we're each trying to out, out compete one another through, through politics, through force. You know, if, if my candidate wins, my preferences are now forced upon you. Or if your candidate wins, your politician, now you can force your preferences upon me, unto me, right? So it's pretty much mob rule in a sense, and that's what happens in government. The majority forces their preferences and opinions unto the minority. Uh, you don't allow this freedom of association or disassociation. You have one giant forced community instead of thousands that could cater to your lifestyle and preferences. You can have a community that's 420 friendly. You can have one right across the street that's not. Right? I won't force you to do that which you don't want to do. Right? Grant me the, the freedom to do that which I want to do with my own body. Right? Or with my own property. Uh, with my own resources. With my own money. Right? Uh, you find all these different areas in our lives that we, we have voluntary interactions and a lot of good stuff comes out there, right? A lot of wealth, a lot of uh, productivity, a lot of technology, a lot of um, a, a growth, uh, I guess, economically. Um, whereas areas where there are violent interactions, the opposite occurs. You know, there's famine, there's uh, destruction, there's war. Um, you know, and a lot of the stuff is funded through taxation. You know, for stealing people's property to fund those services. Um, now, the services the government provides, though, those are monopolized. Right. I want security, I want roads, I want schools, I want first class mail, I want uh, distilled spirits like ABC. But these are the areas government has monopolized. They don't allow you to have the freedom to cancel or unsubscribe as you would with AT&T or Netflix or any other voluntary service. Right? They don't allow you to have the freedom to, to have consent, to withdraw consent, or to say no. Right? They don't even allow you to compete entrepreneurially. To say, you know what, I could provide a better service, a form of security that's not going to be abusive or harmful to you, the consumer. Right? I'm not going to throw anyone into a cage for a victimless crime. Right? So they monopolize it and they outlaw competition. And so that's what, what government is objective to that, that they have a monopoly on those services and that it's, it's uh, services based on non-consent. Right? You're forced to pay for it whether you want it or not. Like social security. You never gave consent to that. Right? But when you were born, you're forced to pay for it. I mean, it's time for you to retire, there'll be nothing left for you, right? Um, so the alternative would be to, to look at what government is objectively, to see the truth of what it is, that it contradicts our moral values to begin with, right? In our day-to-day -day lives, we don't use violence to solve problems, so let's start with that, right? Let's just unite our community with these values instead of dividing each other with politics, right? Um, and using, using our real voice to talk about these issues instead of hiding behind in a, in a curtain at a voting booth, you know, and, and not talking about it at all, you know, secretly every four years. Um, that's what separates us. That's not what unites us. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're kind of here trying to do here. It's uh, not, we're part of a non-political organization, so trying to let like, go the whole Democrat, Republican, Libertarian stuff. Uh, and I know there's a lot of uh, governments out there right now, local governments, trying to um, advocate for legalization of cannabis, for example. But so what? 75 years, to finally we have the freedom to smoke a plant is not a measure of success, right? If, 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 that's the, if that's the standard and how you finally get freedoms, you know, you'll die of old age, still holding a sign begging to be free, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, what areas would you say, um, have you felt, I guess, about government, have, have, I guess, affected you or disaffected you, or any areas of interest you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Uh, what, what areas, uh, I guess perhaps, I, I would imagine that there are areas where I have not yet met one person that's 100% about government. People usually have their discontent in particular areas that they feel has been like social injustices. Um, I was kind of curious if you felt anything like that towards um, politicians or government in, or in general. To be perfectly honest, sorry again, I might take a few seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
be for, to be perfectly honest. Uh, towards myself personally, I think, I suppose the government has been more, more or less fair to me. I was, I was born in a middle class family. I would, I obtained middle class privileges. It's, uh, it's been very normal for, for me particularly, but, I, but, I can't say the same when I see other people. Uh, obviously, if you walk down broad streets, you'll see lots of homeless people and whatnot. And you might argue that it was due to their own incapabilities, lack of strength, or whatnot that led them to that situation. However, and that still doesn't speak very well towards. system uh, area of living right oh, yeah. of, yeah. the, of the supervising authority that that governs them right um, what would uh, what privileges would you say you have I mean I wouldn't say I mean privilege it seems like it sounds like a term that seems unearned right I'm sorry your, your parents work really hard to, to get to to amass the kind of milk to get you to a good school to provide you the other things you need right um, I wouldn't call that as so much as a privilege over people who don't have that sort of stuff I think for the for for the areas of people who don't have that stuff there's there's uh, economic factors set against them uh, for me to achieve those, those standards uh, like you look at the, the currency for example that's also been monopolized 97% of the value of the dollar has lost its value Right? So that hurts the poor the worst. There's no incentive for them to save on an already tight budget to begin with. Every dollar they hide underneath their bed mattress is depreciation in value. Um, all the government restrictions on voluntary interactions, on trade, has made uh, everyone 75% poorer in the past 60 years. Um, you know, permits and licenses, for example, discriminate against the poor from competing. Right? Uh, permits and licenses can, can, could cost upwards to hundreds or thousands of dollars. You know, to start a business, to trade, to create something, and to trade with with their, their fellow human beings, but government says, well, you have to pay us uh, a fraction of that cost. You have to get your license. You have to get a zoning permit inspector. You have to go through all these hoops as to to create, I guess, a good financial standing for yourself. Um, and it can be difficult for a lot of people to to start, especially when they start impoverished to begin with. Um, so I find that there are a lot of uh, government factors that prevent people from reaching up to have a good standard of living. Um, you know, to be of middle class, for example, it's, uh, it's, it's, set up, it's set up against them. Minimum wage, for example, is one. Um, like setting a price, uh, mandating that you have to pay $10 per hour for your employee means that you've made all the contracts for $9 or $8 illegal. Right, so you set up against against the poor who sometimes have least low, low skills, least skills to compete against those who have the skills. So now they can't get a job. Now you just further cause unemployment. Um, instead of having a voluntary interaction with the employee and the uh, uh, employer, right, letting them decide uh, the, the the rates, for example. Um, and of course, if you didn't have all these controlling factors, the business perhaps could pay them more. If they weren't paying so much to the government to begin with to have a business. Um, what, what, what are you studying here? I'm studying psychology and advertising. Oh, advertising, okay. All right, cool. All right, so you have some entrepreneur stuff. Do they teach you any uh, entrepreneur stuff in the classes? Uh, marketing, economics, the, the basics and a little more. All right, what do you want to do with uh, psychology and, and uh, advertising? I want to conquer the world. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, the awesome t-shirts or <laughs> the new line of jackets? What would you say is the most influential things that influence our, our developing lives, at least? Our developing lives? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I'll, um, I guess entrepreneurs would be the ones. They're the ones who are challenging the norms, or the ones who are creating something, taking a risk, risking their own wealth, risking their own resources to see if people like their product. And if people do, they're able to create more of it or improve upon it. Um, you know, for, upgraded, you know, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, new line of product, uh, reinvested, in employing new workers like uh, Lamplighter here in Richmond, opening up the third store of another coffee store, right? Uh, so that, that I think, seems to be, to me, the, the line of area that does provide for society, entrepreneurs. 
Um, I guess not so much specifically on what particular product, but the fact that they create, and there's a demand for that creation. People are willing to, to trade for that. People have a desire for that. I think that's pretty cool. That's an understandable answer. <laughs> what do you want to create? Mm -hmm. uh, well, if I can just backtrack. Yeah, 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 yeah please. Uh, to me, entrepreneurs, there's only a minority of entrepreneurs that honestly create <laughs> something or become as influential enough to to change, I suppose, the mass majority. Uh, obviously, you don't always get a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs yeah. to create a Microsoft <laughs> or Apple. You don't always uh, get to the next CEO, to the next big company and whatnot. Uh, so that's my opinion on that. What I think influences a lot of people are our families, our religion, and our media. And obviously you can see where I'm going from there with advertising. I like... Sorry if I'm going... No, no, please, please continue. No, this is wonderful. This is great. I suppose what I'd like to do with this is not so much use the media, but understand it to the point where I know the spots to hit, uh, per se in order to is this the right word? to steer the direction that people develop into. Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm going with this is that I believe that I have the power to, uh, to obtain power to conquer the world. Right. And as such, I think that sorry again. No, seconds. no, 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 no. Well, I guess if it was a conquering the world, it'd be more of a uh, conquering those markets, and the, that power that still divides from the consumer who has a demand for your ideas, right? So you're only as powerful as your consumer base. Um, the desires, uh, your designs, the desires, uh, I guess the effectiveness of your input in the marketing area um, or, or what you're trying to sell, what you're trying to um, cater to those preferences. And that's where I hope psychology comes to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I understand the consumer base. Nice. All right. Well, it's really all right, So that's good. So your private sector then, right? Not with the uh, big brother uh, government area. <laughs> yeah. um, but I suppose what I'm saying is... I think we all have the power to. to <laughs> Sorry, I'm losing my words. Here. I think we all have the power to change the world, and so something like, if the government itself is immoral, then it's only a simple matter to change it. Perhaps you're, and like I said with my theory on violence, there's always, there's always another option. There's always a bigger picture that people are missing. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the point. Some people think that you need to change the government from within. Some people think that you need to rally the masses and change it from outside and yell at it until it changes. I say, form your own country. Form your own community. To a smaller degree. Yeah. Not so much like sea land. Oh, well, not so much like sea land, but so much as uh, you already have the kind of community of friends that you're already with, right? Um, Established. You're chosen you're interpersonal relationships, right? Voluntary relationships. Maybe magnify that, you know, 50 times fold, and that's the kind of community that caters to your lifestyle and doesn't shame you or make you guilty, feel guilty at all, right? Except establish and protect your own code of ideology. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's the word. <laughs> ideology. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, but I've no, no, no. Th these are good, and that's and that's the, kind of the direction that I would want to go to and, and propose. Uh, thousands of different communities, thousands of. Uh, if, if you want to call it your own country, go for it. As long as it's voluntary, anyone can leave at the same time. Hey, this is not working out for me. I'm going to go right next door where, um, you know, it's an, a naked colony community there. Fur, virtually fun for me. Or, um, you know, only teachers in that community. Or, you know, you have. Um, raving communities over there, you have uh, your Amish community over there, right? And they've kind of formed their own kind of, um, I guess, country, you know, so to speak. Um, but it would be one that all, all the exchanges, all the interactions are voluntary and based on consent. Um, there's no forcing products onto each other, right? Like, uh, again, like social security, right? 
there's no forcing contracts onto babies. Uh, it's like, that's, that's unheard of, who does that? Um, I was like, well, you were born here, so uh, somehow we determined that you gave consent when you were a baby. And so yeah, you have to pay, <laughs> you have to pay up. Um, so yeah, it's anything uh, but that, anything but, uh, but that violence uh, removed. It, it's, I don't know where we'll go from there, but that seems like a good place to start. I once met an anarchist named Scott Crow, who more or less along lines suggested something of instead of like one nation or instead of 50 states, it will be thousands of communities and yeah. whatnot that just happen to intermingle with each other and to fulfill their, their direct needs. Yeah. It's, it's slightly ideological and I, I can't. And I have to admit, I do see some problems with it. It already exists here in Richmond. You have Gooshland, you have the West Side, you have the Fan, you have the Museum District. These are, you have Carter, you have Jackson Ward. You already have these communities that are already associated with each other. Um, you have the, the, the Renaissance District area in Jackson Ward. You know, if you like art, go there. If you like to party, move closer to the Fan, right? You have the areas of the communities here that kind of match each other's preferences to begin with. Right, you have hell block. You know, don't move there unless you don't like parties. Right, you already have these kind of associations of communities here, in, in, in a certain way. Um, the thing is, I guess for most people, it's like they don't like to see opposing preferences on their own property. So you have this natural division, natural association and disassociation, and you can have thousands of communities coexisting among each other, um, kind of in the way they kind of do right now. And there's no really any troubles when you go to the same mall, right? You can't really pinpoint, it's like, well, they're the Gooselanders, and they're the Westlanders, and they're the Fanners. Um, you, there's no much of a, I guess there's a disinterest to kind of approach any, anyone from that. Um, the only interest you have there is uh, people going to a mall, for example, is trying to find the best teacher that matches your preference. The next sale, or like going to um, a food court, you know, the, the only way they're the most aggressive is trying to offer you free samples. Right, um, voluntary, consensual. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much what all these communities would, would be like. And it'll be a community that's set up trying to cater to your preferences and your lifestyle. And say, look, please move over here. Three first three months free. If you don't like it, you know, uh, we'll help you move to another community. Guaranteed. You know, uh, four twenty friendly. Don't ever worry. Here's, here's the rules. Here's the consent. Real contracts that you sign. Right. You want to live in a community with cats, no dogs allowed? Great. Here's here's the community catering to you. Um, whereas in a government, it forces one preference onto everyone. You don't have all this rich, diverse, creative preferences that can coexist, right? Either everyone hates uh, cannabis or they don't. Either everyone's for ultrasounds in a woman's um, privacy area or, or, or they're not, right? One, instead of having all these rich, diverse um, preferences that could come out in a free market. Instead, you have one control preference. And that stifles innovation, that prevents creativity, that um, limits growth. You know, there's no diversity there. The culture that you describe is very, is very nice. It's yeah. very, I don't want to say ideal, because that has the connotation yeah. of being, uh, in clouds. But, yeah. uh, but yes, it's very nice. Yeah. I suppose the most immediate problem is that Another aspect that people look towards in government is protection. Uh, the, the very enforcement that they use to enforce their own rules is, the, is actually the very tool that people seek to, that people look towards the government to protect them. Okay, the no security. Yeah. Alright, so um, do you go to nightclubs here in Richmond? Mm -hmm. Not as often. Not as, as often. I think I should. Uh, right. Well, but, the, but when you go there, there's a bouncer, right? There's a security there. They check your ID. Uh, you come accustomed to the rules. The most common rule at a, at a nightclub is don't be an asshole, right? Uh, or, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, don't be an asshole to the patrons. You're, and that's pretty much the one number one standard rules to these nightclubs. Uh, but you don't see the bouncers, you know, fighting over the bouncers uh, or competing uh, nightclubs, fighting each other. Violence is very costly. Uh, so it's very easy then instead to, it's less costly than to compete against another nightclub to provide you a better uh, enjoyment of entertainment than to hire and go out to all scale war with bouncers against bouncers. Uh, you don't see like Disneyland fighting uh, King's Dominion, uh, and, but they all have their own security. Golf course communities have their own security. Uh, homeowners Association pays for the roads. Um, you know, you have, you, you'll have like a rich, diverse communities for, with their own kind of security. Right, and but it, the the rules that they agree with can be too intolerable because if they were too intolerable, no one would want to live there. 
right? Especially if they have a freedom of choice to say, you know what, sorry, not for me. Or now you can compete and say, you know what, all these communities suck, I'm going to create the community, you know, for my friends and my family that you guys are going to love, right? Not restrictive because now you're free to compete, right? There's no monopoly on land anymore. Right? You, you, you're able now to create, you're able to explore. Um, you have no one stealing 50% of your income anymore under taxes, right? Now you can diverse, you can invest, you can allocate and choose, you can start a Kickstarter campaign. You have a lot more wealth now to, to explore and to create, to invest. Uh, but what if security, uh, security from non-violent threats, security from disputes that you have with your immediate neighbors, yeah. your neighbors that say, Give me back my lawnmower or I'll blast you with a shotgun. Okay, okay, all right, yeah, there, there will be disputes. Uh, so in a way, kind of like right now, when, when you drive, you have insurance, right? You don't really go to court, but if you're like fender bender or hurt, injure someone's property, um, your insurance contacts their insurance. They've already had this arbitration of rule agreements and how to proceed because they don't want to go all out war with Geico versus Allstate. Uh, it's, it's a lot cheaper to like, let's agree with some standard rules. Um, and if we don't like these particular rulings, uh, let's agree to a third party arbitration, right? Someone neutral. And so that could be in the contract. So you can have nonviolent ways to still approach this sort of stuff, right? Uh, then actually going and escalating, uh, furthermore, risk possible harm or injury to yourself, right? You find amicable ways to resolve these disputes. And you find a lot of this stuff already like on, on eBay, on, uh, on Etsy, um, on your credit card company, you know, someone stole your credit card, used you under your name, $200, your company, your bank will credit you $200 back and they'll investigate it themselves, right? So send you a new card, uh, try to see if they can cash the thief themselves, right? Put out a warning. Um, so you'll find amicable ways instead of you having to hunt the person down, uh, but your, your restitution's met. Um, and it doesn't have to be where everyone, you know, how it exists today, where everyone's forced to pay for one uh, police department, right? And there's no quality when you have a monopoly on a service because there's no competition. So they have no need to improve. You know, the quality stagnates and depreciates over time, right? And the cost continues to rise. Um, whereas if you have competition, the opposite occurs. People are trying to offer the lowest deals to most economically affordable to your, to your levels, right? A uh, variety of different types, types of quality, variety of different types of, of costs, right? Versus uh, what exists today, has it's nothing like that, right? You can't cancel or unsubscribe, <laughs> right? Uh, you can't even compete. So, at least in the area where you have no more government, at least it'll be a really free market. At least we can experiment, at least we'll find voluntary consensual solutions, right? Um, the business that, that harms our consumers are the ones that, that get bankrupt the first day, right? Uh, government security can go bankrupt, right? So what if they get rid of a crooked cop? Well, they'll just go in and hire another person. Uh, but the institution itself doesn't go bankrupt. They're still there. <laughs> even if they do a shitty job, even if they do a harmful job, right? Versus uh, in a free market community, hey, I've been in the business 10 years, look at my credit rating system, look at all the, uh, the, look at all the uh, five stars out of five stars. You can look at all the customer reviews, you know, yeah, raise up, you know, help me solve my dispute with my neighbor, you know, they didn't have to go to a fight. Uh, I highly recommend uh, this, this security company, right? Um, you, look, you can meet the, the officers, you know, um, they're not, you don't have to be such in the, in the way that you approach them today, where kind of intimidating like um, it's like what well, I'm paying your salary <laughs> right you're, you're supposed to provide me a service you're making me look like I'm your servant um, so yeah it's it, it could be just like that it doesn't have to be the way it is today but all that will come through entrepreneurship uh, what you mentioned about like, crooked systems crooked organizations yeah and whatnot uh, it sounds like the way to oppose those in in the free community you're describing would be to would be for the for the oppressed people themselves to rise up for and gather their own protectors to repel the crooked system I suppose. Oh so like for example like if there's a, a security company that goes renegade uh, so a security company uh, I mean you can't really expect a security company to come out of nowhere but they, they their monetary base from their subscribers uh, will, will immediately know the next day that they just tricked them and so they just press the button to cancel because there's no taxes and they go bankrupt the next day. But let's suppose that the community is supportive of uh, this renegade security company. Um, this one security company now has to compete against the thousands of voluntary ones 
and yeah, I could have a negotiation with another security company. Like, hey, in, in case uh, I've been in the business for 10 years, there's this new company coming out there. They seem like they're being very aggressive. Um, they're kidnapping their customer bases and taking their money to fund their organization uh, because there's no taxes. So you have to force, you have to, you have to steal to support your organization, your, your business. Um, you make a contract with the other security companies that says, you know, in the event that anybody goes renegade, let's unite for a little bit and, you know, protect uh, our investment, protect our community, protect the people we're supposed to protect each other, right? Um, if they attack me, would you help me out? <laughs> All right, I'll help you out too. Um, it's uh, And at the same time, though, you'll have uh, the one company and one business that tries to exceed and become harmful and abusive, all the other companies out there are waiting for something like that to happen. So they can point it out, so they can advertise, so they can show everyone, look, that's a, you know, that's a crooked organization, they're corrupt, go with us instead. All right, look, 10% off, right? Uh, we'll, we'll buy out the contract for you, you know, if you have to terminate it and you have to pay $150, you know. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate that for you, come be our customer instead, right? Um, and that, that organization goes just like that. There, there's no funding to, to fund that stuff. You need taxes to fund large standing armies. Um, without governments, you don't have any of that. And it's a very costly. It's like in the billions of dollars to, to fund to have a standing army. There's 900 bases the United States has in the world. Um, you look at uh, like the reason why Hitler took over France, for example, in World War II was to take over the tax system. You take over the tax system, you take over fast, you have enough funding for your war machine. Uh, no tax system, no war machine. You can't have that huge standing army. Um, so instead, it's going to be thousands of security companies. And then by then, perhaps, uh, things become virtuous and people understand consent and uh, volunteerism. And uh, well, maybe security is not so much of a big deal anymore. And a lot of the violence that people enact into one another is fine, you know, um, but when, by the time you're a child, you know, a parent spanks you, hits you, they're teaching you that violence is a viable solution to solve your problems when you grow up. You know, so, help uh, to talk to parents who find alternative teacher-child negotiation skills, right? Entrepreneurship. Um, and to avoid the child from having to grow up to find that hurting people is a way to solve my problems and removes a generation of violent people. You know, race peaceful generations. So maybe a lot of this violent tendency will kind of weed itself out and then there won't be much need of a security company, you know? Uh, like, there's no need for pager companies today, right? That's an outdated model. <laughs> Nobody uses that anymore. So it could be, I don't know, that's uh, something that, like you're mentioning, idealism. Um, yeah, I, I don't subscribe to utopia at all. I want there to be problems. Problems are good, right? As long as the problems show us that there's an area where we can continue to improve, to grow, to develop, to upgrade, to uh, to, to keep going further, right, to a better place. Um, so I think there, yeah, there should always be problems, different ways we can solve them. But the ways we solve it should be in the same way that in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't use violence to solve problems. So let's start there. Let's use the plurality of solutions that we have that we're armed with to to go forward with this. Unfortunately, government only knows how to solve problems through the throat of the use of violence. Um, and it doesn't go anywhere. It only continues to persist. Well, it continues to make things worse. Uh, I have two points to make. Yeah, yeah, please, uh, please. Well, actually, well, actually, I'll start with one. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'll talk about two, but remind me to get back to one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess the one to get back to later. Uh, the pursuit of eliminating violence. Uh, until I find a better word, that's very nice. But violence to me seems very natural with anger, and anger is ob anger is obviously very inherent to people. It's a natural emotion to feel. It's a natural, it's a natural, not quite instinct, but response. Yeah. But uh, we'll get back to that. Going back a little farther, the thing is, there have been. There has been old historical evidence of, I suppose, free-form security forces or community-based uh, enforcers, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And those are what we call nowadays the Mafia and the Yakuza. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, and honestly, they didn't really need to get big, big to become threatening. People turned to them because obviously the enforcement back then was very crooked, and they didn't, they couldn't trust the police, right. so they trusted the mafia. And for a while, it was all good and whatnot. Uh, 
uh, but obviously, but obviously the mafia are individual people taking time out of their lives to like make sure everything is all well and good that no one's messing with their with, with their people. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they needed to get favors, get some protection money as well, and it was a very informal system. So there will be there would have been times that they forget to pay protection money that they couldn't pay protection money and but it's very stressful work so they naturally get violent about it right so but that's but that's suppose. protectionism right that's that's forced to pay for protectionism you're being still forced to pay for security the Zakuza and the mafia for example the only reason why those particular organizations exist is because government has made some particular trade illegal right mostly drugs so when you make a drug illegal, uh, you increase is, uh, the price of it, the demand for it, because it's difficult to get now. Whereas it used to be abundant and cheap and easier to get, you made one particular product illegal, you create this artificial inflation in the price, and those are the, that's why the mafia came here during prohibition, right? It's like alcohol is illegal, let's go over here and, and, and that illicit trade. That's the only reason they came here. Uh, in Japan, there's all their illicit, uh, illegal trades, and that's where you have these criminal organizations arising. Without government to say that this trade is not permissible and that one is, uh, when you have these free communities, you don't have those problems anymore. If you don't like cannabis, there's no, there's our community. If you like it, here's our community. There's no, the the cost to, to support those kinds of um, criminal organizations cease to exist because their funding comes from that illicit trade. They need the drugs to be illegal to make profit. Um, so you wouldn't have a jacuzzi or a mafia uh, in a free and voluntary society without government. They, they, those structures can only exist because of government make those trades illegal but it increases their profits because that's uh, I mean for example there's a lot of people who trade cannabis here for example wants the law to be illegal because they're the value of the cannabis is pretty high if it was legal anyone can grow it uh, if there is no government involvement anyone can grow it anyone can compete the price of, a, of it can, can go down right so there's no incentive to involve yourself in uh, violent activities because it's not it's not there's no risk reward for it uh, the, the benefits towards it doesn't really match up in relation to it um, and at the same time, when you make something illegal, uh, you can't find uh, disputes outside of that. Violence is a vile, is the only pretty much way to solve those disputes because it's illegal to begin with. You can't go to a court and say, hey, he, he stole my, my bag of weed. What? Go to jail, right? <laughs> to a cage. So you can't even uh, come out publicly to talk about how you got ripped off or that this is a bad product because it's illegal to begin with. So when government makes these uh, areas illegal in the market, you remove uh, the possibility of voluntary consensual interactions to find um, better disputes, non-violent disputes. The thing about that is, is uh, criminal syndicates like that di didn't bring drugs in because, because it was illegal, because they were the bad guys. Uh, they brought it in because they were providing a service to, yeah. their, com to their community because right. they thought that they were being the good guys and whatnot. Uh, and uh, on a different note, I suppose. There, you were saying something about the first thing, the first point you wanted to make about violence, something about anger, and, and that's perfectly fine. You, there, you can still have healthy outlets of um, of aggression, like boxing, for example, right? Um, at least that's consensual. You agree to the rules, right? Nothing below the waist, no ear body, Mike Tyson, and then we can box, right? But that's consensual. You agree to the consequences of penalty, for example, or um, being kicked out if you're too aggressive. I'll skirt outside the rules of the particular game. Yellow flag, red card, um, point deduction. Uh, so you can still have, even these qualities may be uh, innate, you can still have healthy outlets to participate with other people in, in those particular areas. Um, instead of, uh, I don't know, resorting to, um, to, I guess, the, the physical violence of, of uh, the nature of what is government, you know? Um, over a million people, for example, caged here in this country, more than any other country in the world. You know, more than totalitarian states like China or North Korea. Um, most of it is for victimless crimes. So, yeah, you can still have boxing, you can still have outlets of aggression, you can still have martial arts, UFC, <laughs> um, all that stuff. The thing about that is using sports as, an, as the main mode of outlet for aggression, for aggressive behavior. Uh, well, I suppose to just slightly backtrack, an outlet uh, still requires some form of self-control on the individual. Yeah. It requires that they recognize that this is the only time 
that Fight Club is the only time that you can fight, that boxing is the only time you can box. Yeah. But anger in of itself isn't restricted to that. Uh, so. Well, then that's that's something you have to explore. Talk to a therapist. Find out why you get so angry so easy. Why are you prone to emotional outbursts? What is it that you can't control about your emotions that you allow other people to have that control over you, right? Because if you're going to get angry, you're allowing then external forces to have that power over you. What? Why are you allowing that to happen to begin with? Why are you allowing strange the words of strangers to affect you so emotionally? And I think that's something that takes some self-discovery and. Uh, some mental health to, to look into. That in of itself requires dialogue. Yeah. It requires the outreach into another individual to say, what, there's something wrong with me. Can Empathy. You help, can yeah. help me with that? Uh, then we also run into the problem of pride. People uh, people will naturally think that, no, I am I am in self-control. I am not so weak as to see, as to need the crush of another person. I right. need this anger I will solve by myself right. and it, uh, you can have that you can still have I mean there, there'll still be non-profit organizations trying to say, you know what about the poor there'll still be people who question what about the people who have these uh, difficulties of expressing their anger there'll still be people like that and you'll still have organizations who will want to help and reach out and uh, provide them the things the resources that they need to get to a better place to be back in joint civilization um, to be back and embraced by your community. You know, no community is going to want to live right next door to someone who's prone to anger all the time and, you know, smashing windows. And um, no, no one would want to um, accept a contract to live in such a community. It's like, oh, I'm good. I'm not going to move there. You know, that, that guy's going crazy with his lawnmower, threatening, accusing everybody. Sorry. And the person who allows that sort of stuff to happen, you know, uh, will be out of a job. No business viable solutions to entertain such communities, right? Um, You'll, but you'll still have people who care about mental health. Um, so that, that will still exist. You'll still have people asking, what about them? What about her? What about uh, this guy over there? You know, I, I like to help them out. You'll still have empathy. You might have empathy, but the thing is, people are, uh, even if people aren't asking for something, they are still sacrificing something when they when they put effort into, when they put action towards their empathy, they're sacrificing time. Yeah. Uh, and over, t and it might be fine if you're just taking a few minutes out of your day to come talk to this person. But uh, if you form an organization around it, a nonprofit, per se, uh, you're you're going to eventually expect something out of it. And nonprofits, right now, uh, they tend to defer to the backing of the government to help. So to help supply them besides donation or whatnot. So in a free in a free community like this, a nonprofit risks becoming the next I suppose the next syndicate, the next uh, the next organization that's trying to help their community but gets lost in that ideal. Uh well, I mean if, if it's a an organization that lost its aim of its mission then you know people don't fund that stuff anymore, you know, there, there'll be no philanthropists who would want to fund that, you know, you'll have someone maybe disaffected by that organization, you know what, this is not actually working, I'm going to create my own nonprofit, right, um, or maybe create a profit organization that does help, it is funded by voluntary contributions, you know, start a Kickstarter campaign, um, and that's, I don't know, that's, uh, at, at that point, that's, that's something that uh, we're, we just have to figure out and work on together. Again, there's no idealism way to solve these problems. It's gonna, there's not one person that has a solution, right? It's going to be millions of people that's going to come up with millions of creative ideas and solutions. Um, like when you go to a mall, you see a lot of different t-shirt businesses there. You know, in a free society, you'll have millions of ideas on how to perhaps best uh, serve and provide a service to that particular person. Right, uh, so you'll, you'll have competing ideas in, in a free and voluntary society, and how best to deliver. So if one of them doesn't work, great. You have you know, 999,000 uh, ideas out there still that they could possibly work. Right, um, and that's the great thing about the free market that you have competing ideas, you have competing solutions. It's not just one solution again, like with government. It's thousands, voluntary, consensual solutions that could work. Maybe not. Maybe their business model was uh, failed. Maybe they didn't have you hired on their team in the marketing and psychology uh, research uh, to provide and, and deliver. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, entrepreneurship is not really something that they teach so much in public schools, right? Uh, negotiation. Um, so that's those are the areas that you would need to to succeed in the nonprofit world and in the business world in the entrepreneurship world. Possibly. Yeah. But as much as people like to argue this uh, this statement, but I think businesses actually are individuals or entities in of themselves. Businesses or organizations in this context. Organizations will attempt to self-sustain themselves. It sounds like in this in this free community of millions of different or of different small communities and organizations that uh, that the bad apples will eventually rot themselves out and fall from the tree. Yeah. But there are such things as par as parasites, as fungus, as the ones that try to self that try are just trying to self-sustain themselves, even if they don't realize that they're they might not realize that they're bad, they might do, but the thing is, uh, so long as they're made up of individuals that want to increase their quality of life, the organization that's made up of those individuals will try to self-sustain itself, mm -hmm. will try to continue to grow, and regardless of the quality of lives of others outside of it. Yeah, and that's where you know consumer reports come in. That's where checking the uh, credit rating system of this new business that comes in into town trying to provide you a service. Like, well, how long have you been in business? Oh, we just uh, do you invest anything in marketing? Because if you invest in marketing, that's so sad. You're making an investment in your business. You're going to stick around here for quite some time, right? Uh, can I see some consumer reports on your organization? Right? It's like, no, I'm good. I'm good with my own service. I don't think I'm interested in switching over. Um, you'll have checks and balances in that particular area. Um, I'm sure you you do. Review Reviews before you buy a product, right? Uh, compare it, contrast. You know, do I want to get a Mac or an Apple? I mean, or, or, or uh, a Windows? Um, particular video games, Xbox versus PlayStation. Uh, cars, uh, clothing styles, uh, particular shoes. Um, uh, Ten dollar haircut versus uh, going to a stylist. You know, uh, check the review. Are they pretty good at what they do? You know, hear a uh, friend's review, uh, recommendations. Um, it's a lot of these areas that kind of prevent the, the back apples from coming out. But at the same time, they'll naturally just go away, just like um, Blockbuster, right? I mean, I don't know anyone that's weeping and crying for them going out of business. They're, 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 they're gone. They're bankrupt. Uh, I think in the next two months, they're finally liquidating everything and it's gone. It disappeared. Right? And naturally, that's what businesses do. They can't evolve, they can't compete, they can't diversify, they can't innovate, they can't keep up with the growing demand, with the innovation. Uh, with, with the demand for creativity, for new products, um, yeah, and they go away. But the people will be absorbed in other companies, right? And other businesses. Uh, it's like, well, I think it's time for me to quit now. You know, uh, I don't think I'm going to be the last person here at the cashier. Uh, it's, it's nobody's coming here. So turning in my resignation, I'm going over to um, work with uh, Netflix, you know, uh, or start my own business. I've been in, I've been doing this for 12 years. I think I have a good idea. And, you know, so you'll, you'll find interesting solutions. So it's not so much a bad thing if bad apples just go away. Um, do you still want to, you know, hold, have a pager? <laughs> right? Oh shit, I gotta go, I gotta go to a payphone, right? I, I like the cell phone uh, business. <laughs> um, maybe the next will be the Google Glasses stuff that's coming out and we'll go, go, go away with the uh, cell phones. I don't know, who knows how, about that particular area, but that's, if the, that's what people want and that's what uh, people strive themselves to, to provide. Uh, and the bad idea is just go. I mean, I don't want to go back to living in two caves. I like, I like houses. <laughs> I like the AC, I like the heater. Um, I like those uh, products that uh, the market has created. Um, but yeah, um, that's, that's there's nothing wrong with the bad, bad business idea that just doesn't, doesn't work out. Though, uh, hopefully it's, uh, most businesses don't, uh, generally. Uh, usually like the, the, exter the termination time looks like, I think, 30 years uh, on average max for businesses to collapse. But of course, those people are diversifying and go somewhere else, right? Start up all, all, that, all those years that you've uh, accumulated that capital invested in another project. All right, keep going. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but in this example, in this example uh, it requires on the presence of a, strong, of a stronger, more, more desirable entity, Netflix over blockbusters and whatnot. Uh, what, what about the situations that lack uh, a more desirable entities, I suppose, to go on a wider scale. If people continue to believe that America is is the greatest country in the world, and to go anywhere else will just 
reduce your quality of life? Uh, well, I guess in comparing, you're comparing government to other governments then? Uh, governments to generally organization entities. Right. Uh, well, government doesn't really have a commitment to provide you a good quality of product. Because I have an argument, you can look at uh, USPS, for example. Um, the post office here, the United States Post Office, they have a monopoly on first class mail, delivering pieces of paper. No business is allowed to deliver pieces of paper. Uh, FedEx, UPS, DHL are only allowed to deliver packages. They, they, they could deliver your letter, but in a package. <laughs> uh, so that's why sometimes they're, they're, the cost are extremely high, because it's illegal for them to compete in that market. Um, so, but you have USPS who owns this entire market to themselves because they've outlawed competition and still they're $16 billion in debt. They can't make wise solutions, uh, quick economic solutions because they're not a business. Right? The only thing they can do is continue to accumulate debt. Right? And you're forced to pay for it through your taxes. They borrow loans at low interest that no, no, no businesses have uh, access to and that's how they survive. Uh, the cost of stamps that continues to increase. Right? Because they have no competition, no, there's no competitor to say, well, we can sell it for this much, this is for a lower price. Right? When you have a monopoly, costs continue to increase. Um, for example, one of the ways that USPS tried to solve a problem of long lines and, and the wait lines there was to remove the clocks. They thought if they remove the clocks, that could, uh, people won't look at the time, they won't know that they've been waiting in line for a long time. Um, and that's, that's the solution. And that's, that's how they do it. Uh, I mean, next time, look at a USPS post box and look at right next to it, the FedEx box is clean. They always maintain it. They want to make sure it has a good image. And then you look at the USPS, you know, rusted, decrepit, uh, worn. Um, they're, they're not a business. They can't keep up that way. Um, whereas uh, you would if you were not a government. <laughs> you would if you were a private industry, private business. You can make those decisions faster. Uh, you have a real incentive to take care of your property. Right? You, you own it. Um, you don't have those government solutions. Uh, so that's, and then imagine and, and extrapolate that situation with USPS, and that's how all government agencies are um, and debt, unfunded liabilities, um, veering towards bankruptcy, like in Detroit. Um, and that's, uh, I don't know, that's not something I want to repeat here in Richmond. <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I guess. Going back to, um, I guess what we were talking about earlier in the beginning, yeah, that's, I don't know how, what the future is going to look like, but a good place to start is by doing what, what we already have in our lives and having that integrity against that violence and, and that commitment, right? Uh, the consistency of our principles and to, to still find voluntary solutions and reject the ideas that, uh, that conflict with that, that uh, misleads us into compromising our integrity, right? Um, I'd rather have virtue than, than none or to compromise on, on that and make excuses. Excuses lead to more excuses, right? Exceptions lead to more exceptions and that's how you got government to begin with. <laughs> An exception to violence. And now you have uh, the largest empire in the world with the USA. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, businesses can make exceptions. They make exceptions to in, involve themselves in corruption and violence and they get fined out, they go bankrupt, they're gone, right? Um, without a government, you have no longer state-backed corporations. You don't, you don't have government-backed corporations anymore. Now anyone can compete. There's no uh, entry levels that prevent you because of government, because competing businesses lobby for those laws to prevent smaller businesses from competing with the uh, megalithic ones. Um, so anyone can compete now. And that's something a lot of businesses don't want. And that's why sometimes they advocate for government, because it prevents the entry for someone like you and I from trying to compete. So you'll find a lot more rich, rich wealth in a free and voluntary society. Now, 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 finally, you can pursue your own happiness. You can pursue your dreams without no one getting in your way, no one robbing half of your income, no one restricting and telling what you can and cannot do. Right? You're very humanistic, <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I find that very admirable. Thank you. I, I think that's something a little. Everyone can use nowadays a little more humanism. Uh, sorry, uh, no. but this has been a very good conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, um, but if I can just ask one more question. Yes, please. What would you say is the most immediate thing that we need to do? Uh, I suppose as a, as this community, yeah. what 
what's the most immediate thing that we should and can do? Uh, to reach out to your friends, reach out to the people you care about, and talk to them about these issues. You know, change doesn't start in a White House in D.C. It doesn't start in countries you've never been to. It starts with ourselves at home and in our own community. People talk about, well, what about, like, you think about changing the world? No, you think about changing Richmond. This is where I live, this is where my friends, my family are, this is where I'm, I'm going to, to live for the rest of my life. I love this city, I love this town. Um, and for me, it starts with my, in my own interpersonal relationship, right? The people I care about, and to start having this dialogue, to start having these conversations, to talk about what is truth, to talk about what is virtue, to talk about what is morality, what is government, what is violence. Uh, questions that uh, you're not, uh, it's, it's never asked of you, <laughs> uh, especially in public school settings. You're not, you, you can't, uh, they won't even define these words for you, because if they were to define it, you'll come to the realization that government contradicts that very principle to begin with. Um, they'll never define what is a citizen in government textbooks. They'll never define what is consent. They'll never define a social contract. It doesn't exist. They can't show it to me, like a mortgage contract or a car payment contract. Um, I want real consensual contracts. Uh, I want a community based on consent. And that starts um, with ourselves. It starts with uh, the people I love and care about. And then after that, um, you start reaching out to other members of your community. My name is Cal. I'm Lewis. Lewis. Pleasure to meet you, Lewis. Like Lewis. You are very interesting. <laughs> Uh, I also see a bit of a metaphor in the sign that you use. <laughs> you're not, reach, you're, not uh, you're not trying to impose your ideals on anyone. You're waiting for them to come to you. And again, you're very humanistic, and I admire that. Thank you, Lewis. And I've enjoyed our talk today. Me too. Me too. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thanks for, thanks for like for. I guess we usually sometimes step out. Sometimes I might be curious at some point. So I was like, I guess I've been waiting for you today. <laughs> uh, what well, we do monthly gatherings, potlucks, community discussions, um, and just trying to find a better place, trying to go to a better place, um, trying to analyze these problems, and uh, to see what we can do as a community in Richmond. To, to move forward with that, um, outside of politics, you know? So, uh, you definitely should, should come by. I have a newsletter if you'd like to sign up for one. Sure. Yeah? All right.